Um, so you're, you're someone that's been in politics for a long time. I mean, you worked for APP before, or Super PAC, and before that you were running campaigns, you ran your dad's presidential campaign. Why politics? I mean, you're pretty smart, and you've been successful. <laughs> uh, you could have... Everybody write that down. <laughs> I'd, but, li I'd like to put that on the record if we could. <laughs> um, but you could have done anything. I mean, you could have worked for a big financial firm. You could have been a lawyer. I mean, you could have made it rain. Why didn't you, why did you choose politics over the money and all of that other stuff? Uh, you know, I, I feel like it's um, growing up in the house I did. I loved spending time with my dad. I had a front row seat to what I considered uh, the best show on earth. And, um, you know, when normal kids growing up had probably a little bit more regular summers, they went to camp and did other things. I did the Arkansas festival circuit and I would travel with my dad. I, been to all 75 counties in Arkansas more times than I could count, and I would go to these events and festivals, especially over the summer, I'd get a stack of brochures, and after I passed them out, my dad would give me $5, which in Arkansas would, you know, get you one ride and like a, a pretzel or one kind of treat, and so I consider that to be a pretty good day. And getting to do that and spend that time with my dad was a really special, important part of my childhood. I loved every bit of it. I love the people component of politics. I think that's often lost. Um, in a state like Arkansas, it's very retail politics driven. And so I had the opportunity to meet people from every walk of life. To me, every policy has a face. I can put somebody that I've met, somebody that I know that either wants this change to happen, sometimes doesn't want this change to happen, or that desperately needs uh, something of a massive turnaround to happen that government can impact. And so getting to be part of that process, I got to see that firsthand. And um, as we joke in our family, once you get in, it's kind of like the mafia. You got to be killed to get out. <laughs> and so, so far, I haven't been killed just yet. Uh, I think I've had a few near experiences, but, but managed to come out and, um, you know, just grateful for the opportunity to be able to do it. And I don't know why I would ever walk away if I, if I get to have this chance and this opportunity to be part of it. Um, our dear friend, Frank. Yeah, that, I think that's really <laughs> I paid that guy $20 before we came in to clap every time I finished. Um, so Frank and Maggie actually just had an article in First Things published, and it had a very provocative title, Culture is Downstream of Politics. Uh, it's based actually on a brand new APP report right here. We'll give a copy to everyone in the room as you leave. Um, but it, it, it argues a very interesting idea, which is that politics is not downstream from culture, which is the conventional wisdom, that politics is actually part of culture, and it's a driving force of culture. Um, you obviously haven't read the report yet because it just got off the presses. Um, but what do you think about that? Do you think that politics actually impacts culture? And if so, how so? Absolutely, and I think, I think they both impact one another. Um, I think it's a, it can be a very, uh, I, I don't want to say anything contrary to the report and get myself in trouble, but I think it can be a very reciprocal uh, process. And a lot of the things that are happening in our culture, you see drive what becomes important in politics and vice versa. And so I do think that there is um, certainly a reciprocal process that we go through. Um, again, things that become very important within our society that no one cared about 10 years ago, and sometimes even 10 days ago, uh, but something happens and it triggers it and it becomes the dominant uh, topic of conversation both in culture and politics. And so to try to separate the two I think is pretty impossible. No, that, that, that's great. That, that's actually what we, we argue. Um, so see, I'm doing good so, so far. I obviously think it's great. Um, Another area that APP focuses on is religious freedom. And many people in this room, it's like their top concern. Uh, can you speak a little bit to what uh, the president's priorities are when it comes to protecting the religious freedom and the First Amendment? Yeah, and this was uh, something that he spoke about on the campaign. I think that the biggest place that you can see him uh, protecting religious freedom, but not just religious freedom, but all of freedom, uh, and making sure that the judiciary is no longer creating law, um, but is the remaking that is taking place. It's often overlooked and often not talked about. Um, everyone focuses on uh, Neil Gorsuch, which is a huge victory um, and something that I think will 
will have a very lasting impact and legacy on our country. But beyond that is the entire remake of the federal judiciary that is, I think, going to be one of the greatest and most important things that President Trump does in his time in office. Um, we have seen, there have been actually a couple of stories in the last few weeks that talk about um, a total shift in the judiciary and the way that it looks. Uh, and these are young guys that really believe in upholding the Constitution and, and protecting it and not taking the politics that they have and trying to implement that into uh, the judiciary. And I think that's gonna make a really big difference. And that's something that is gonna last so much further beyond his uh, administration. But I think that's something that we're gonna see impact for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. One of the other concerns that uh, a lot of people in the crowd have is the encroachment of the administrative state. And I think that you've been, you know, being in the White House, you've seen this firsthand, where the administrative state is, you know, they're doing everything they can to stop President Trump from being able to enact his agenda and from placing his people in, in the right places. Um, how is how's President Trump dealing with that, and, and what are his priorities there? Well, he's such a patient person when it comes to things like that, that, um, you know, I think you saw a great example of that this week with um, the appointment of Mick Mulvaney as the acting director to um, run. <laughs> and, and the struggle that uh, took place in a very political move uh, to try to take the power away from the president being able to make that appointment. And I think that um, was an example, a very sad example of the struggle that we have every day. Um, but look, at the end of the day, it came back to a decision that was made by a judge that President Trump had appointed recently. And that's why I think um, focusing so much on the judiciary is going to have such a big impact and will allow a lot more of the big policy changes and the shifts and the radical change that he's bringing to Washington go into effect uh, is by doing that. I think, you know, one of the places that we've seen um, have a problem is in, sometimes in the intelligence community with some of the leaks that have come out that have been uh, very troubling and putting a focus on that and making sure that doesn't continue and continue to be a really big problem, I think is gonna be important for us moving forward. Okay. Um, and I actually, I only have one more question left and it's gonna take a bit of a serious turn. Um, uh -oh. Look, we've got a bunch of members of the media here. We've got a bunch of members of- uh, You guys forgot to tell me that. Movement. I would've said some nicer things. <laughs> and there is this looming scandal surrounding you. Um, and I think everyone in the room wants to know, and I just want to give you the opportunity to set the record straight. Did you, in fact, make that pie or not? I, the people want to know. You know, um, being from the South, I think one of the most offensive things that you could accuse somebody of is a store-bought pie. And, um, Not only did I make the pie this Thanksgiving, I make it every holiday for my family, um, including at Christmas, I used to make it for all of my neighbors on my street. So don't believe me, go back to Arkansas, check with them. The only thing that you may hear that's slightly different, and I feel like I'm probably on pretty safe ground, I know there's quite a few Catholics in the room, I usually make it with bourbon. Don't tell, don't tell my dad. I'm Southern Baptist, but I married a Catholic, so I feel like it balances out perfectly fine. Um, but I, I absolutely made the pie, and I have uh, since this week purchased the ingredients to make uh, many more, and I will be making sure I get those uh, to some of my friends in the White House briefing room uh, in, in, in due time. I would have done it tonight, but I had to be here with you guys, so I'm, I'm gonna work on it here over the next few days and make sure I get those to them. Thank you very much, Sarah, oh, thank and thank you. you for being such a great role model. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Thank you.